Hello and welcome to the latest webinar in the Elemental Talks programme. Our topic today, the heat is on, tackling the biggest challenge to decarbonisation. The chair for the next 60 minutes, my name is Jim McClelland. I'm founder and editor of Sust Meme, home to both the magazine and the top 500 rankings. Joining me on the panel this afternoon, this morning even, are Rebecca Dib simkin Global Director of Product and Marketing at Octopus Energy. Duncan Price, Partner Sustainability and Climate Change at Borough Happold, and Richard Halsey, Director Energy Systems Catapult. It's all live with the Q&A to finish, so pop your questions. You'll probably see a Q&A box perhaps at the bottom of your screen. You pose them, I'll ask them, they'll answer them. So a little bit about Elemental. The webinar forms part of a programme hosted, produced by Elemental, www.elementalexpo.com. It's the online community for professionals focused on innovation in heat, water, air and energy, the vital elements within the built environment now and in the future. You'll find a full diary of events on the website, range of upcoming webinars. You can also now view the back catalogue, a broad range of hot topics. It's all available on demand, great who's who of speakers and everything is free to access. There are also in-depth interviews to watch, plus longer form articles on The Pulse, including one pen by myself just published on robots at work beneath our feet. So lots of lockdown infotainment. By way of a very brief intro from me, decarbonizing heat. Heat effectively poses the biggest problem present for the decarbonization of the UK as it gears up to, we've heard these targets, cut greenhouse gas emissions 68% by 2030, pursue a pathway towards net zero by 2050. But industrial processes included, Heating currently accounts for about 37% of total UK carbon emissions. Of course, efficiency measures such as insulation, double glazing, have a big role to play in reducing heat loss and energy consumption. But the focus of today's webinar be on the range of heating systems, technologies and products on offer, both now and in the future to help address this critical challenge. The menu of options might include electrification, heat pumps, hybrid systems, fuel cells, micro CHP, green gas, hydrogen, biomethane, plus district and communal heating networks, all of the above. And our panel will consider positive and negative factors in impacting the rollout of low to zero carbon solutions. They could include grid infrastructure, product and safety standards, affordability, grant funding, even installer skills and training. So plenty to cover. So to begin with, I'd like to start by asking, where are we with the heat challenge at present in the UK? And our panelists, I invite you to introduce yourselves, share your perspectives and some opening insights. So briefly, who are you? Where do you fit into the puzzle? Where do you think heat is right now on its journey to decarbonisation? So first, from the perspective of an energy market disruptor, Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Uh, so I'm Rebecca Dibsimkin and I look after product development and marketing for Octopus Energy, Octopus Energy Group. Um, and we're an energy tech business, but most people will know us as a, as a green energy um, supplier. So we supply gas and electricity um, to about two million homes in the UK. And uh, also we have a launch businesses in the US, um, Germany, Australia, New Zealand and soon to come Japan. Um, and it's really interesting, actually. So in, in, the, in the brief, it was a very good briefing for this uh, for this session. And um, I, there was a brilliant sentence that said the debate will discuss and review the relative merits of a menu of options, including electrification, heat pumps, hybrid systems, fuel cells, micro CHP, green gas, hydrogen, biomethane, plus district and communal heating networks. Now, I have worked in energy for about 15 years. I was at British Gas for years. I then worked in their hive business, looking at smart thermostats. Um, and I had to Google a couple of those terms because I thought, I'm actually not quite sure what the micro CHP is. That's a bit embarrassing, isn't it? A kind of energy expert. And I think that when it comes to decarbonisation of heat, I worry all the time that normal humans don't really understand what it means and how it's relevant for them. And actually, one of the things that well, the most important thing for us at Octopus is by bringing, doing all the work in the background so that actually consumers can just get cheaper, greener power when they put the light switch on with awesome customer service. And actually, you know, we create solutions for them that they don't necessarily have to change their ways to adapt to. And I think that's really important because otherwise it just becomes this kind of niche techie thing that no one really gets. You know, techie people, niche people mm -hmm. get it, but not normal humans. So that's where I fit in. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Nice point about the language bar and potential jargon. I know, um, especially chairing physical events, 
uh, I used to ask the audience to put their hands up and put it down if I mentioned a term or a word they wouldn't be comfortable trying to describe or explain. And these were pulled all from the front pages of newspapers or major websites. So in, in theory, they were the popular and common language that was being used by the mainstream. And so many hens went down so quickly. And this, as you suggest, was a, a more specialist or a green audience. So in theory, they had the advantage. And there were only ever a few hardcore hands up right at the end with every little acronym and abbreviation. But it is that, that kind of jargon busting is still a challenge, I think, in many respects, especially, of course, if you're uh, talking about consumers. So thank you for that. Duncan is an expert focused on low carbon and net zero buildings. Who are you, where do you fit, and where are we on the journey at present? Thanks, Jim, and good morning, everybody. Yeah, hi, I'm Duncan Price. Uh, I'm a partner at Bureau Happolds, uh, heading up our work on sustainability and climate change. Um, for those who don't know Bureau Happolds, we're an uh, engineering consultancy of about 2,000 people, um, of which half are in the UK, focused on the built environment and how do we decarbonize the built environment. Um, and, and actually, uh, one of the things that's quite interesting is that we've seen a a kind of real proliferation of net zero commitments as well. I mean, we're, we're one of them as well. We've committed to be net zero carbon for our own business operations from April this year. And we just set science-based targets as well to, to drive down energy consumption and to, to set us on the path in the short term over the next five years of, of how we're going to start to drive down emissions and then to kind of switch to, to fuels, uh, to, to lower carbon fuels. and. Um, and finally some offsetting, no doubt, as, as part of that as well. But what's quite interesting is I think that that reflects a broader trend in the built environment industry as well, whether it's um, investors, developers, asset owners or occupiers of buildings, or even indeed local authorities setting and declaring climate emergencies. I think around about 200 plus local authorities have now declared climate emergencies, generally trying to get to net zero carbon by 2030 or 2040. Um, and those are very often politically driven and the the roadmap of actually how they're going to get there you know is, is in various states of development and likewise corporates whether they're investors or developers like say or, or owners of assets often set net zero carbon trajectories and, and maybe like us setting science-based targets in line with say the one and a half degree scenario of the Paris Agreement so trying to kind of set themselves on that road but quite quickly once you've done the energy efficiency work you're really into the difficult bit then of, of switching away from low carb from high carbon fuels to low carbon fuels um and and that i think is sort of now setting us up for the next challenge which is uh well actually how do we get the level of of energy efficiency but also how do we switch to low carbon heat because heat is a critical part of that component in in the built environment yeah nice point and uh, as you say obviously it's great there is there are in a nice way, plenty of laggards, there's plenty of low-hanging fruit still, but once you have done some of that, and once you've done a little of the obvious, especially if you're reporting year on year on the progress you're making as an organisation against your targets, you need some more good news every 12 months, <laughs> you know, and it gets increasingly challenging. So, really at the interface of things, Richard, an enabler and champion of transformative innovation, where do you see things at present? Thanks, Jim, and uh, morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, Richard Halsey, I'm director at the Energy Systems Catapults. We are one of a network of innovation centres uh, kind of working across the UK, and our mission is to, to unleash the opportunities from innovation and the creation of new markets um, to support the transformation and decarbonisation of our energy system. Uh, I've worked in, in clean tech and innovation for over 20 years. I previously led the National Smart Systems and Heat Programme with the Energy Technologies Institute. Um, I've also led the Catapult's work on uh, improving uh, local area energy planning as a framework to support smarter, more integrated uh, local energy systems. And I'm also leading the Catapult support uh, for Bayes in the Electrification of Heat Demonstration Project. Uh, and I'm also a member of the Bayes Hydrogen Advisory Council. So a number of different perspectives and angles on the, the challenge of heat. Um, and I think, Jim, in terms of the, the challenge and where we are, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that we're we're behind where we need to be. Um, he, he is hard. I think I think both Rebecca and Duncan have highlighted that it's it's tough, it's difficult, and it gets it gets in our face, it gets it gets in our homes, it gets in our lives in a way that the decarbonisation of power arguably doesn't and hasn't. Um, and and it's going to involve things that are much closer and more visible to us. Um, so on on the plus side, though, I think we have started to recognise its importance. 
and how big a play, uh, piece it has to play, particularly in the context of delivering net zero. Um, and we've seen a lot of vision and ambition coming from government and also from, from local authorities, from businesses like, like Octopus, like Borough, like, um, you know, like the, the wider kind of uh, energy networks about their ambition and commitment to getting to net zero. I think what we, what we need to start to see is the movement away from those ambitions and commitments to investable, credible plans for delivery and what that actually means in practice. Um, I think, you know, which, which, I, which I think is probably the next step on the journey. If we don't get on with that, we're going to potentially fall even further behind. And I think just picking up on what Rebecca was saying, one of the things I feel quite passionately about is that there is an opportunity for low and zero carbon heat, not just to be equivalent and as good as what we have today, but to offer us something better, something smarter, something more exciting, something cooler. Um, and I really think that is where there is the kind of business innovation need and the opportunity for, for businesses to develop things that, that people really want and that people pull. Um, uh, and that's, again, something where there is, a, there is an, as much an opportunity as there is a challenge. Absolutely. Points well made. And uh, yeah, as uh, sharing some of these, I'm forever using the phrases like, well, we're moving from aspiration to action, from intention to implementation. We're walking the talk, but that is where we are. And there is a gap in many cases that needs to be bridged. So I would remind viewers to use the Q&A, pop your questions in the question box. We'll have around 20 minutes at the end for that. Now in the middle section, I'd like to get into some of the more difficult aspects, some of the more thorny issues. I'd like to zoom in on specifics and challenge our panel a little bit about why we're not moving forward further, faster. So what's the problem? Innovation, infrastructure, cost, culture, skills. What needs to change or accelerate to make these targets achievable? So start with you, Duncan, and I'm pointing fingers. Are individual building developers, owners, occupiers, their consultants, contractors, the tech, are they the problem? Or is it more systemic? Is it whole communities, districts, cities, governments who are failing to drive the decarbonisation agenda? It's a really good question, Jim. Um, I think you've got high end sort of property owners and, and corporate clients who have now sort of set these targets. I think um, if you look at, say, the Better Buildings Partnership, which is at 32 of the largest real estate investment trusts and, and similar investors, you know, I think the vast majority of those have now set climate change trajectories in there. And a key part of that is decarbonizing heat. And a lot of that is about electrifying heat in buildings. Um, and so they're getting on with the job, actually. You know, they said, right, we need to do it. They're doing energy surveys, they're doing energy audits, they're working out their investment plans, thinking about how they switch out um, gas boilers into heat pumps, for example, or connecting to low temperature heat networks. So I think that at the kind of um, institutional level and the corporate level, I think that it's in hand. It's early stages, but it's in hand and there's a commitment and there's, there's money and there's investment and they can, they can sort of see the need to do that. Likewise, big campus operators like universities, we're doing a lot of work with universities at the moment who are thinking about their assets, whether that's the existing buildings that they own or the heat networks that they might have that they're now um, wanted to transition away perhaps from gas CHP to something lower carbon and zero carbon. So we've definitely seen a shift actually, in it, I'd say in the last 12 months in particular, of real firm commitment from institutions and, and um, corporates who are absolutely intent on doing it and are coming up with the pathways to do that, but they know they've got a lot to do. I think, I think where the real challenge actually is, is around, probably is around the mass market more, and it's about confidence in supply chain, particularly for, for homes and for smaller <laughs> businesses who just don't have the bandwidth, they don't have the, the capital, they don't have the um, investment grade projects ready to go. And, and that is a much more difficult market to crack. And, you know, we, I think UK Green Building Council came up with a fantastic uh, publication a few months ago, looking at all, you know, again, at the kind of retrofit market and the policy landscape and all the barriers that need to be overcome, all the challenges, whether it's, you know, lack of incentives or hassle factors or um, lack of confidence. Um, and I think part of, part of the challenge is, is actually also about economics as well, you know, um, you know, all of the all the kind of green towers have been loaded onto electricity and if we're trying to if one of the solutions particularly for, for towns and cities is probably more electrification of heat then 
you know, how do we how do we shift? You know, because because gas doesn't have all those externalities loaded on in the same way that perhaps electricity is. So maybe we need a shift, a shift of, of the economic burden um, so that we can make sure that the economics really stack up for consumers as well. And if you're going to switch to to heat pumps, you know, how can we how can we take advantage of the of the agile, flexible tariffs, which I know Octopus have, have been quite pioneering in? How can we have an integrated approach as um, you know, as as you know, as we we're saying about kind of making it cool. You know, how how can we how can we shift so it's not just about hassle and difficulty, but um, you know, something which is much more appealing to consumers. Nice point, yeah. And with a lot of sustainability initiatives, it's important to make it easy, yeah, you know, um, but also a bit aspirational. You know, and that is one of the challenges with words like efficiency. That's usually about doing without and economies and. Um, a lot of negatives, which is very valuable, but it's not a sell exactly, you know. So, um, so Richard, in terms of challenges, I'll ask you, do we not need to put more time and money into scaling the innovation we already have in the marketplace rather than endlessly chasing shiny new, perhaps more sexy solutions? Yeah, I think a really good question, Jim. And I think sort of building on what Duncan was saying, I think... Sometimes we, we, we sort of bracket innovation as about technology and solely about technology. And there's a must, as much innovation to be had in the integration of technology and business mm -hmm. models and the application of technology as there is in the development of the technology. I, I think actually you're, you're, you're right. What we need to have is a, is, is, is a focus on developing those integrated solutions and developing the supporting business models and innovation that, that can unlock that consumer pull for some of these technologies rather than expecting a new technology to come out and, and solve, the, uh, sort of sol solve the problem. I, I, I think there is a massive need for continued technology innovation. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think that's something that never ends. We should be continually looking to develop and identify new technologies. But what in the UK in particular, in relation to the, the, the challenge of decarbonizing heat, we need to start to do is figure out how do we get them to, to be combined together and to connect into uh, we, we, via businesses into people. I, I, I totally agree with what Duncan was saying that the real hard yards is in the 25, you know, 27, I think it's about 27 million existing homes in the UK and how we get them uh, decarbonized. We're going to have to have a way of, of making it easy, but I, I think it's more than making it easy. It is making it desirable. It's, made, it's offering people, and I actually, this is probably almost laying down the gauntlet a little bit to Rebecca and, and her sort of peers and other businesses and saying, right, how, how can businesses come forward with propositions, with solutions that, that I want to buy, that I'm prepared to, to kind of engage with and, and, and kind of connect with? So, so I think that, that that's a really important part of it. I, I do think there does need to be a distinction between the kind of above ground and the below ground, and particularly where you have monopoly infrastructure, um, you know, th those are long-term investments that who require long lead time. So there are sort of societal and public goods decisions and investments that need to be made to enable those business propositions and those solutions to come forward. So I think we need to, which, which comes back to why we need to have sort of credible plans for infrastructure and those investments that need to be made in the heat networks that Duncan was talking about in repurposing the gas grid in the upgrading of the electricity network for large scale heat pumps or you know individual homes having heat pumps uh, for the integration of thermal storage and generation technologies and then that becomes you almost like your foundational layer that you can develop those customer propositions and solutions up, uh, you know kind of up, up on top of I think the other thing I'll just say as well is that your digital technology creates the opportunity for us to do this in a way that, that, that hasn't been possible before. We've seen in other sectors how you know, digitalization has transformed the ability to do things in finance, in, in food, in, in, in entertainment. The same thing is waiting to happen in energy. And, and there is an opportunity to harness access to data, more open data and information, artificial intelligence, algorithms, to, to, to give, give that, that, that better low carbon heating solution for people. Excellent, thank you. And interestingly, anticipate uh, we have a webinar at one this afternoon on digitalization, actually <laughs> discussing a number of those things. And you've nicely queued up with Rebecca. And this is my provocation to you here that 
I'm saying as a retail supplier, when the economy is under pressure, incomes are feeling the squeeze as they might well be for a lot of people now. It's all going to come down to cost, the size of the bill. So consumers might talk green, but ultimately they buy cheap. What are your thoughts okay. on that, yeah. Rebecca? Well, I think just and just harking back to what what the gents have said previously, because um, you know how do we how do we fix this decarbonisation of heat thing? And there was there were so many wise wise words in there, and I think that you know yeah one of the challenges there's lots of different kind of new technologies, and they're all at you know often you feel like it's all a bit innovative and it's all a bit at an early stage. And yes, if I really wanted to commit to kitting out my house with a load of yep. stuff that took power from the grid and exported it and did all this kind of stuff, yes, I could probably do that, but I'd have to put an investment, but you know time into it, money into it. And it's a bit geeky and a bit niche. And actually, uh, you know, the, the word aspirational, like we need to make this tech aspirational. I actually slightly disagree. I, I understand aspirational as in something that I want to have rather than what I've already got. But actually, most normal humans, when their heating breaks in their house, generally most people have gas boiler systems. So the white box in the corner starts making a really weird noise. And you think, bugger, I need to get that sorted before winter. And so you get on Google and you go new boiler, right? And then which gas pops up or box pops up or someone pops up and you you know you book a job and someone comes in generally a bloke sometimes a woman generally a bloke comes in takes the white box out put the white box in before they go they say this is how you turn it on and off right that is your user experience as a consumer and that's kind of what you want and as you want it to be you know it's going to be a few grand but you want it to be fairly low price you want it to be easy you want someone to pitch up you know you just that what we need to do for the decarbonization heat for me is in the home to unlock these 28 million households and nearly 2 million households a year who have um, who need a new a new boiler, a new heating system, is actually get into that purchase journey. So you need to be offering people to unlock master demand, offering a product that is just a replacement for what they would normally do. So it's, you know, and at the moment, if I kind of want to invest in a heat pump or engage in a heat pump, um, it feels like a complicated thing to do. It still feels like, even though they're kind of 20 years old, I think heat pumps actually are older than that, but they've been available for a while, but it's still kind of, the tech feels a bit new and it's a bit clunky and it's a bit, you know, so people are kind of, you know, a little bit shy of it. Um, and actually because of that, the market has never been enabled to develop. So actually you only get those mass economies of, of scale, the, the cheap that you were talking about, when actually the market's developed to a point where all pressures push those costs down, you know, in hardware, in installation, it becomes the norm. And I think that's the slight problem with decarbonisation of heat. I think there are other industries that struggle with, as well with it, like kind of IoT as a, as a whole, that you've got loads of really clever stuff, but no one's got it mass market enough to make it, you know, just into a BAU purchase journey that consumers will have, you know, and consumers, they do care. They do want to, you know, they don't want to blow up the world. Everybody's, you know, thinking about the future and trying to make it a slightly better place, but lives are hard. And so, you know, they, we we found early days with, with Octopus that people wouldn't, you know, uh, apart from a hardcore niche, mm -hmm. wouldn't switch for green. They did switch for price and for customer service, but yeah. actually green was a great, you know, once you're, once you're with green, you kind of like, you, you don't want to go back. So if you can give someone a solution, which is similar to what they've, they were looking for anyway, around the same price, and actually bonus, you're saving mm -hmm. the world, that's where the magic lies. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, and I think in many respects, you're talking about de-risking a lot of these choices and replacement shopping, which of course is what a lot of people do all the time when they need a new pair of jeans or as you say, you know, a new lawnmower or anything of that sort. But could I just ask you one further question, Rebecca, before I move on? Is there still this myth of the green premium, i.e. if it's green, it always costs more? Is that still, is that a misperception or is that a reasonable concern on the part of consumers? Um, I, would, I would hope that it's becoming less and less of a concern. So the proportion of energy supplies offering greener standards has significantly increased over the last few years. And actually with a lot of our marketing, we've actually spent... Um, our key line is green doesn't have to cost the earth actually green should be the same price as brown or even cheaper that a greener electron should be a cheaper electron yeah. um, and actually you know a lot of the the agile tariffs that were mentioned earlier unlock that and actually enable customers with a smart meter to 
um, you know, get get cheaper power when it's greener because you know when the wind blows and there's more green energy, then it becomes cheaper. It's basic economics. And yes, I'm sure if you stopped 100 people in the streets, some people would still feel that green and organic and all those kind of labels, you know, do come with a premium. But I think um, I think we have seen that shift. Um, you know, as we've got we've gone from zero to two million customers in, in five years as a green energy company. Mm-hmm. People stick with us. Our attention is incredibly high. Um, and it just shows that people kind of do realize now that actually they can get a good price, get awesome customer service and not to be contributing for it to excessive uh, climate change as well. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. And especially for as they're dubbed the Blue Planet generation who are uh, more eco conscious, if you like, and more aware of their own responsibility and choices. So um, we, I can see some questions coming in. Keep them coming. There's some, uh, I wouldn't say they're stinkers, but they're good and challenging. This is what we want. Um, so we've looked at some of the areas that are difficult, some of the thorny issues, some of the challenges. And now like last round of questions from me to the panel before Q&A, reasons to be cheerful. I'd like to look at how things could go well and where we might get to and, you know, roast into spectacles, if you like, if, if we do deliver on these ambitions that we talk about. So successful, sustainable approaches to tackling problems that can help us hit targets and exceed expectations, which is some of what we've been talking about. So first up, Richard, how can investing in decarbonizing heat actually create much needed economic growth and jobs in the UK? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, the as, as much as it represents a challenge, you know, there's always two sides to the coin. As much as the challenge is huge, the opportunity is equally huge. You know, for every cost, there is an investment. Um, uh, so, so I think some of it is about the lens uh, that's, that's applied to some of that. Um, the opportunity to create the, the kind of the workforce of the future and to, in effect, develop the skills and position the UK as a leader um, in de- delivering integrated, smarter, low carbon heating solutions certainly exists. The nature and the challenge of both our housing stock and buildings and our regulatory and policy environment means that we have you know, quite a complex uh, but valuable and potentially scalable and replicable in, in some contexts way of doing things. So we have the opportunity to both learn how to do this, how to move um, and, and in effect, you know, deliver a huge volume of, of, of activity and jobs that are going to be needed at all levels. So there's, you know, there's digital jobs, there's, you know, there's the, the you know, tr- transfer of uh, you know, of the, of the heating engineers that Rebecca was talking about, you know, arguably those heating engineers are not just going to be, I think, in my view, going in and sw- flipping a box out. They're going to potentially be need to be digitally savvy to be able to connect and configure and pair you know, a variety of devices. They're going to need to be able to not only be gas engineers, but also electrical engineers, arguably, if you've got hybrid and more complex solutions having to be put into people's homes. So there's a massive... Um, kind of opportunity in that space. And I, th- I do believe that for, for UK businesses, there's a huge opportunity to, to create solutions. And I think what, what sort of Rebecca was alluding to as well is the, is the idea of a solution and outcome focused approach and, 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 and being able to kind of figure that out and figure out what those customer journeys are and what the value propositions are represents a massive economic opportunity for the UK and ultimately, underneath that, there will be there will be the kind of opportunity for, for for jobs and development of skills. I do. I mean, just coming back on one point, I do. I, I do think I, I really aspire that the the, the 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 future when you know in twenty thirty five in twenty forty that when you know my heating system breaks, it isn't a case of some bloke turning up and changing the white box. I actually hope that my heating system is diagnosed well before time and I'm sent an email to tell me that there needs to be some software patch to try and avoid the breakdown. And that actually that I, at those points of intervention, I may be being offered upgrades or I'm being offered new things that I can kind of tie into what I'm prepared to pay for and what I value. And um, that there's things maybe promoting the connection of my electric vehicle with my new hybrid heating system. And that there's an opportunity for me to to kind of use those things in a more sophisticated way if I enable some different control mechanisms. So I think there is a there is real opportunity for those things to be to be much more sophisticated and much more integrated. Thanks. And, and a huge, you know, if the UK can create, you know, this this sophisticated, digitally savvy uh, kind of workforce that can deliver the carbonization of heat, you know, that that is a 
you know, a real potential opportunity in terms of post covered uh, kind of green recovery as well. Excellent points. And uh, yeah, I think interestingly on that, I mean, we do already have the situation where say some high end uh, washing machines, you have preventative measures and you have remote fixes where they would basically talk to you through your phone and uh, maybe reset or whatever. Interestingly, I think the pandemic might jump forward some of those solutions because what it means is fewer site visits of every sort. You know, it might mean that we all become um, sort of digital engineers for our own white goods, which is maybe not where we want to go. But I think it is interesting how some of uh, the uh, the consumer sectors are beginning to work with that kind of idea. So, Rebecca, take some of that. An uplifting finish. How can decarbonisation give us the 21st century energy market we all want and actually need? Oh, decarbonisation. I mean, I think someone mentioned earlier that power was a bit further ahead than, than decarbonisation. People do kind of get what green power is, but don't really get what decarbonisation is. And I think it's, you know, it's it's taking those messages out. So again, I, you know, I talk about human, normal humans a lot, um, that you can, you know, the, the stuff that comes to your home can be cheaper and greener um, and unlimited because you get renewables right. It's an unlimited supply. Um, and also the way that you then turn the, that power in your homes into, into heat can be cheaper and greener and not damaging for, for the environment. So I think it's, it's hugely exciting for people if we can get that message out and get that message to, to mass market, which um, someone also said, said earlier, you know, that's the hardest thing to do. It's, it's, it's what octopus do. You know, we've, we've literally kind of come from, come from nothing and in five years, two million customers, we've got um, you know, we're in country, different countries around the world. We've got 17 million accounts contracted globally. So we've got big ambitions to take that message whole scale. And we're really lucky enough to be able to, we have a, a, a really great R&D department internally, um, but also to work with innovators in the energy system who are building new kinds of tech. And then we can work with them and go, right, you know, what kind of tech, what, what can we take out with how we know to do it out to, out to the mass market? So yeah, hugely exciting. Excellent, thank you. And finally, before Q and A, and we've got the questions queuing up a bit now. Duncan, in a net zero world, what might success look like for, if you like, the heat map of tomorrow? Uh, well, okay. So there needs to be a substantial improvement in the energy efficiency of the existing stock, um, coupled with probably, I, I, if I was to bank on it, electrification of heat or use of secondary heat sources in our towns and cities probably keep the hydrogen for the difficult sectors like um, you know kind of large industrial applications or some of the transport applications where it's harder to electrify. I think we'll be uh, realizing counting valuing and realizing the multiple benefits of more energy efficient and zero carbon heating system um, well you know so we will we'll have looked at the benefits of a healthy clean efficient resilient town or city and we'll have factored that into our economic thinking, whether it's a local authority trying to you know, bank the benefits of clean air or <laughs> better walking and cycling and um, the use of zero carbon heat sources. Um, I think all that only be, needs to be underpinned by a smart grid and building controls to optimize the loads, as we used to say. I mean, as you know, we'll have sorted out the difficult bit about peak loads, you know, we'll have managed energy and heat, we'll be sharing heat around our towns and cities. We'll have economies of scale um, and we'll have driven that mass market through a mixture of carrots and sticks and tambourines. You know, we'll have, yeah. we'll have, got, we'll have got the, the financial incentives cracked. We'll probably have some min minimum standards linked into trigger points like sales and lettings of property. We'll have, um, you know, and I think that mass market, we were starting to see it happening. You know, you've got the, the kind of the green team, I think in the sun and the, the mass media. Maybe some questions in the road to COP26. Does the media dictate the agenda or does public opinion? And mm -hmm. actually, you know, that, that mixture of, you know, will, will heat pumps be as attractive as a Tesla? But at the same time, going back to Rebecca's point, sustainable zero carbon living needs to just be natural and simple and easy. And um, so all of those things. Excellent. Right. And that leads us very nicely through to the Q&A. We're going to open matters up now to the virtual floor. Keep those questions coming. So I said, you pose them, I'll ask them, Duncan, Richard and Rebecca will answer them. Right, we've got a few questions already uh, rushing through. So if I take, um, let me see now, if I take one, um, first from Stuart Walker, 
I like to take one. Really, this is about perhaps unintended consequences, if you like. How do you make sure decarbonisation doesn't lead to negative impacts in other environmental measures? Is there a balance to be struck between picking the lowest carbon route, bearing in mind other impacts may cause problems down the line? We're maybe talking about a holistic and integrated solution. And with that, I'd also like to take one from Steve Webster, who asks about the fuel poor, how are they going to be better helped? Because I think it's important also to bring in the social sustainability um, issues as well, because heat or eat is um, the classic terrible dilemma that some people in uh, tough situations face. So unintended consequences, you know, is it single issue politics? We're just talking carbon. Are we missing out? Are we going to have other issues crop up with uh, pursuing this uh, this uh, mono line, if you like. I wonder who if, who'd like to jump in first on that. Open one for anybody. I'll, I'll, have, a go, I'll have a go at that. I, I think we've we've had a, a sorry tale in the last I don't know twenty years in decarbonising built environment of of kind of going for these bridging technologies that don't really get us to where we need to be. And you know we, we had all sorts of, and unintended consequences, whether that's uh, sort of biomass or gas CHP. Mm -hmm. And we've now got these investments into heat networks which aren't really going to get us to where we need to be you don't, not really as low carbon as you need to be so you've got to, you've kind of you really need to just focus on the end game and making sure we don't have obsolete technologies that lock us into uh halfway towards a solution where it's not the real solution mm -hmm. and it's really important that we do think about air quality it's really important we do think about um affordability to run buildings and um and I think the, the fuel poverty angle is really important. I do think it's very important that we get the economics right for heat pumps. I mean, whether you go for, uh, for electrification of heat or you go for hydrogen, either way, there's substantial investment required. I think something like 11% of transformers are gonna need upgrading in the next price control period, 2023, even for a modest upgrade of, of electric vehicles and heat pumps. We also need massive re-engineering of the gas grid if we're gonna have lots of hydrogen. So. Either way, there's investment required, and it's really important that we don't load all of that onto consumers in an imbalanced way. And I do worry that if there's a, a big shift towards heat pumps without energy efficiency and without balancing the, the externalities and don't put everything onto heat, uh, onto electricity, I think there's a, there's a danger we end up with higher energy bills. So you've got to think of it together so that consumers have warmer homes, cheaper, cheaper homes, and the prices of that investment have been a fairly fairly apportioned between probably between taxpayers and consumers um and making sure that the you know that the those that are able to pay can pay and those that are fuel poor don't end up with a worse situation yeah rebecca i think i'd have to invite you to comment on that really because of course yeah. fuel bills heat bills are classic metric of deprivation and mm -hmm. you are of course a commercial enterprise mm -hmm. and you are looking to grow and make profit but I wonder if you could offer some comment on um, that kind of bigger picture. Uh, we were set up as a business to drive the green energy revolution as I said talk about offering cheaper greener power but also with a real um, sense of social justice as a business mm -hmm. and that we felt that the energy market as a whole was broken um, and that people were you know potentially unfairly locked into higher tariffs than they needed to be you know was there profiteering it was just it was just a, a broken market so we are very clear as an energy company that you know a whole mantra of way of being is that we never promise to be the absolute cheapest because often the very cheapest if you go on you switch a you know arguably loss leading or might go pops so you have to be careful but we're always you know we we add a very small margin to our cost of doing business you know often less than less than five percent um to the the wholesale cost that we have to we have to pay um and within that so i'm going to say something slightly controversial which sometimes gets me in, into trouble because there's probably some people um watching who who this would touch but you know my job with the innovative tariffs that we create with the agile tariffs are particularly popular in that kind of niche innovators early adopters segment who often often blokes often kind of a little bit older often have a bit of cash right often drive a tesla now my job is not to come up with tariffs that enable people who already drive Tesla, Teslas to save money, although we love them because actually what they enable us to do is create tariffs and create ways of structuring costs that actually means that we can take um, 
opportunities for cheaper greener power to everyone. So they bring down the costs for everyone. And that's what I'm about. So it's not about creating products that, yes, you can save money if you optimize your, your usage and you turn things on and off and you connect stuff and you have a you know, charging cable and all that kind of stuff. But actually, it's all cheaper for everyone. Um, and actually, we you know, delight in working with those innovators. So actually when it comes to the fuel, fuel pure or poor, actually we're giving them a solution for better. So I, I see a world that, you know, in a, in a few years time, when your, your boiler goes pop, actually you have a solution in, you know, an electric boiler mm -hmm. in, a, in a heat pump, which is as easy to put in, which is, you know, a hardware has cost parity, if not cheaper, um, and that it's cheaper to run as well and greener to run. And some things we need, Duncan touched on this, that actually the way that taxes are, are stacked at the moment mm -hmm. against electricity rather than gas is, is unhelpful. Um, and we, you know, had a lot of conversation. We, we talk quite a lot about that. But there's other things as well about how you can optimise power usage. So so for me, it's like, yeah, totally agree. This is this is not leaving the fuel pool behind. That is, this is unlocking the benefits of cheaper, greener power for everyone at the moment using those fab early adopters who will kind of get really engaged with it and help us tweak, you know, the product that we are then taking to everybody who doesn't necessarily have the time or the space or you know, the inclination to engage with it right now. Does that, does that make sense? Is that kind of, you know. Yes, it does. And, it, and it nicely also, I've got a couple of questions for Richard Kudo, but just to bring one back to Duncan there, picking up on what Rebecca said, Steve West Webster also asked about the gas versus electric and tariffs and carbon taxation. And he said, current gas and electricity price differential makes heat pumps versus gas boiler a challenging sell. Agile tariffs, et cetera, add complexity. He asked for views on increasing the cost of gas through carbon taxation and how that might affect the masses. So picking up just on a little of what Rebecca said and maybe taking that question there, Duncan, I wonder if you'd like to comment again on the fact that, you know, it, it's a scrap between gas and electric in some cases uh, and where tax could fit into that. I think there's probably three dimensions to this to consider. One is kind of fixed cost versus variable costs. Um, so, you know, sort of standing charges versus tariff, variable tariff kind of elements. And, mm -hmm. um, and another angle is, is kind of the split of cost between gas and electricity. And, and there's a sort of third angle, which is kind of how, how one takes carbon taxes and perhaps reinvest those into energy efficiency to, to address the fuel poor. I mean, we've seen with, say, um, some gas CHP and heat network solutions over the last 10 years, actually, if you don't if you don't manage the performance of those systems really really well and you don't think properly about how you um, spread those costs around consumers you can end up with a very substantial uh, kind of standing charge even if the energy pricing might be might be lower so you've got to look at both together and you've got to think about not just the pence per kilowatt hour but the overall cost to the consumer and so having driving down demand thinking about the fixed costs and thinking about the tariffs together is, is really important but it is you know if we are going to have a big switch away from gas to zero carbon heat driven by heat pumps for example then it is really important that we um we think about the relative pricing of, of carbon taxes between the two i would love to see what's happened in other countries which is that actually carbon tax revenue from the eu emissions trading scheme or the uk emissions trading scheme and the, the carbon floor price maybe actually gets recycled back into energy efficiency um, so that we can we can kind of take that revenue and, and drive down uh, energy bills for everybody. Nice point. Thank you. And um, Richard, I've got a couple. Here. I'm going to give you two at once here, I think. Um, one has come in anonymously, this one. Um, in order to avoid some of the upfront costs of char uh, changing to low carbon heating tech, is it feasible the next 10 years people will stop owning their heating box and start subscribing to heating as a service? So more kind of lease and subscription models as opposed to outright purchase. That's question one. And the second one um, from Alexander Luke, great webinar, nothing much. Uh, it's a skills shortage skills challenge uh, question as well. Heat pump sales currently 30,000 a year need to surpass a million a year by 2030. Basically, uh, Alexander's asking, um, how do we develop the workforce? Are there any particular challenges to overcome, etc. So a couple for you to lead off on there, Richard. One, as a service, can we switch to subscription models? Would that not um, de-risk it for a lot of people? very familiar in many of our 
other purchasing um, scenarios. And the other one from Alexander, skills. Where are we going to find the people from? Yeah, brilliant. I mean, really good questions. I mean, certainly on the on the heat as a service one, um, you know, if you look at every other sector, that's the way things have gone. Um, the 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 uh, the catapult we developed a, a kind of living lab of connected homes where we're working with businesses to develop and test new heat service propositions. We've been doing that with a number of, of different businesses who are trying to figure out right how does that work, um, what actually does that mean. Uh, how might you uh, and what's the consumer appeal? Uh, and I th certainly think it's 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 a route that will appeal for certain customer segments. Um, you know, there are, there is hardly anything that you can't buy as a service nowadays, and particularly the younger generations, everything uh, seems to be purchased as a, as a service. So there is certainly an opportunity, and overcoming the hurdle of the upfront capital cost, it certainly provides a mechanism for doing that. Un underneath any service you know model for the consumer, there has to be a viable business model where the, 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 the provider of that service has to be able to, to basically make money. And, and some of the challenges is how you can monetize uh, that uh, you know, effectively as a business, but also how can you manage the risk to vulnerable consumers and exploitation, which you know, is always there as a risk. Um, so that there's the need to, I, I personally think there is a need to create a degree of regulatory freedom or sandbox where some of those solutions can be tested and developed collaboratively with consumers and and pursued at scale. Quite often, one of the barriers to, to new service models in the energy sector is that you hit a, a kind of regulatory or legislative barrier, or you hit a price cap consideration that means that actually, although there might be a consumer base that's willing to pay, you're not able to offer that service to them because of the wider market context. But it certainly represents a massive opportunity for overcoming some of those capital barriers, I think. Um, and, and I think the other thing I'd say is, and we know a lot of businesses from outside the space are now looking at that. So businesses in other sectors thinking about, right, how do I apply a similar business model in the energy sector, um, you know, internationally. Um, so it's certainly a, a kind of massive opportunity in, in, in that space as, as overcoming some of those hurdles. On the skills, um, yeah, I mean, I think, as I said earlier, we, we are going to need new skills. Um, and we need to start thinking early about what those skills of the future need to be. We need to provide the infrastructure, I think, to, to create and support the nurturing of those skills of the future. Um, the, 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 the idea that it's, it's very easy to shift the kind of existing workforce and move it across, actually, you know, I think in terms of the world that we're going to be going into, we need to ensure that there's the support, the training, the, the kind of foundational pillars uh, for building that workforce of the future in place. And I think that's a role where, you know, where, where government obviously has a, has a role, but equally business, I think, has an important role to think about, well, what, what are its heating engineers of the future going to be? What, when, when will it need them? How does it start to create the foundations for them? The, I, I, I think the real challenge on that is you very quickly get in a, in a chicken and egg problem yep. where you kind of go, well, but there's no demand for my product, so I don't need a workforce, so I can't recruit a workforce, so I need a demand for my product exactly. before I can create a workforce. So... What I personally, I, I think what we need to start to think about is can we have, is there some kind of at scale demonstration and, and exhibitions of, of integrated zero carbon heating in places that can provide almost the catalyst for building that workforce. Mm -hmm. um, so it's so doing some things at scale, exemplars, pathfinders, that you can start to mobilize a workforce behind and connect a workforce with could potentially provide us, you know, that, that kind of springboard. Um, it's not easy. I mean, working at the moment on the electrification of heat program with Bayes, you know, it's, it, there's hard yards here, you know, here to, to, to both overcome some of the issues, particularly with the UK's housing stock and the nature of the UK, particularly private owner attitudes to their homes and the, uh, you know, the challenges that you can face when you're getting into people's homes. Um, so, so, so there's a variety of different skills. One of the things that, that um, uh, has come across quite strongly is the way that actually we approach heating, a, a bit like sort of Rebecca was talking about, as a guy comes in with a box. But it, when you look at buying a fitted wardrobe, you would, you know, businesses approach selling a fitted wardrobe like it's almost a design experience. And somebody comes round, they talk to you, they give you a glossy brochure, they give you lots of kind of and, it, and all it is is a few panels of wood sort of plugged into the side of your, your wall and drilled in and you're you know sold it at many thousands of pounds so, so there's something about the experience when somebody comes to you and take, taking that opportunity um you know which in itself is a different skill 
you know, there's almost a design and a sales skill that's needed, as well as a kind of technical heating system integration skill. And those things need to potentially be combined through businesses. Um, but a massive opportunity, I think, in that space as, as, as well. Um, but, but there's got to be some foundations put in place, otherwise we won't have the skills of the future that we need. Richard, Richard, the foundation is long term, clear policy signals and absolute commitment from government. Right. This is critical, you know, and you know, it's kind of it's really heartening. We now have, you know, at least, you know, a, a kind of uh, a target of 68 percent reduction by 2030 because it's 10 years, which is a, well, nine years now, which is a reasonable kind of it's long enough to be meaningful but short enough to be real but we absolutely need to stick to the pathway and have all the policy mechanisms and you know proper well-funded well-resourced policies um to stop this kind of start stop start stop in the industry which yeah, just leads to, to to a lack of skills a lack of trained people that are able to deliver the high quality service that consumers and customers want. I think it's a really good really good point I mean and I think as well there's the, there's the balance of you need policy trajectory and certainty but also you need which helps to build business confidence oh. which supports building those skills but but you know I still think you you also underneath that need to start to see credible plans of what actually needs to happen you know to start to kind of give the confidence both to government and industry that there is there is clarity of what needs to come about so there's a, there's a clear signal of, of intent from a policy perspective but we start to need to kind of be able to define well what actually does that mean in a place what does the market opportunity look like for a business to be able to deploy something and therefore what is the workforce that it needs to kind of build to be able to deploy so those things kind of need to happen in parallel um, but without that that direction of travel and the, the certainty and the policy direction yeah we, we won't and, and I must say, I do think we, we're starting to build some of that, you know, the 2025 position on non-fossil fuel heating, you know, the, the business commitments to, to net zero, the, you know, the government's commitment in the white paper, you know, there are the signs there, but I think always more can be done. There's always a kind of slightly harder push that can come. Excellent. And I've got, to, I've got to move down to the last sort of, ooh, within the last 10 minutes now, still a few questions. I've got one on uh, collaboration that I'd like to ask generally, but I've also had one come in via LinkedIn for Rebecca. This is a slightly stiff one saying it's also on collaboration, but it says uh, many industries are seeing transformative change uh, are calling for a collaborative ethos. Uh, I guess they're referring to like a more open source approach. Uh, the energy market, they say, looks relatively competitive and adversarial. There's blood in the water is their phrase. So they're asking, could you not go further, faster, together? <laughs> <We've>, <laughs> I, so this is funny. So, so I so I worked for British Gas for, for 10 years because it's a great business. My other half is an engineer at British Gas. So outside of my home, I have British Gas Fan Park. Um, and yeah, you know, it's a, it's a competitive commercial business, but actually that, I think there's a huge amount of, of cooperation and integration. Um, so we actually are, our technology... Kraken, so part of the Octopus Energy Group, um, Kraken Technologies, our, our CRM and billing and smart energy platform is actually licensed by both Good Energy and E.ON. Um, so we have, you know, um, competitively ring fence, um, but actually huge collaboration between teams. And it's quite, it's quite fun, actually, because actually Good Energy and ourselves are at, you know, slightly different ends of of um of you know opinions on some elements of green so there'll be some fun feisty twitter debates on some elements but actually some fundamental working together underneath that um and i think that you know for me personally i'd like to leave a better greener world for my children i think that what octopus i think with the octopus is is getting a lot of stuff right we've got the technology we've got the complete customer focus we're not held up with little legacy systems which the other suppliers are i'm certainly not in the business of wanting to take anyone else down um and yes it's you know we're capitalist it's a capitalist society you know we look at um we're trying to get as many customers as we can but i'd, I'd hope that there's no real pain between between energy companies it's certainly not something that i personally feel yeah. I mean, just building on that sort of, Jim, you know, certainly as part of the electrification of heat demonstration project with, with Bayes, I mean, there's three sort of energy retailers sort of leading the activity and the approach is incredibly sort of open and collaborative and, and trying to develop solutions that, 
you know, that work and share intelligence and knowledge and information to help support. And I think that's recognizing both that the market opportunity is, is, is quite large potentially, um, but also the value in learning and understanding from others is potentially really valuable and important. So that sort of, you know, sort of almost shared learning environments and innovating and collaborating together. I, I certainly sense that there is an appetite kind of amongst all players, not just, just retailers like, like, like Rebecca's business, but, but across the value chain, appetite from businesses working and collaborating together on solutions. Well, that I, brings I, me... I was going to say, can I just, just say from the built environment side as well, that, that massive collaboration, UK Green Building Council in particular is very good at convening uh, consultants, contractors, clients around net zero agenda. Um, we set up Construction Declares, which has got about, we've got hundreds and hundreds of uh, people around the world now all committed to particular targets and sharing information and collaboration. So I think it's really happening. Great. Well, that leads me perfectly. It doesn't always happen like this. To one final question, picking up on these points. Nicholas Davis has asked, mentioning something Richard said earlier, seems like international collaboration business policy rela, is vital in order to bring in the right solutions effectively. And they ask, which markets and territories could the UK learn from? So I'd just like to invite the panel just to suggest any regions, areas, other sectors, industries, just throw some names in the hat at this point of where we could be looking for inspiration and ideas. So I'm, anybody, I'm, go. I've, got, I've got one just because I was looking at it quite recently. So Helsinki launched a prize based competition for the decarbonisation of heat where they basically put a million, well, I think it was a million kind of uh, as a prize. And they've said, right, businesses come forward. We want to achieve X, Y and Z. We want Low, low carbon heat we want no biomass we want so they, they set some parameters and they basically said right businesses have a go and solve that problem for us and and there is a prize of uh, i think it's a million yep. um is but it? then they're also uh, ultimately the prize is obviously implementation of this of, of a solution so i think actually that's quite an interesting and creative way um and uh, you know of, of potentially sort of setting the laying the gauntlet down to business to come up with something rather than kind of predetermining the technology solutions etc so i think that's quite an interesting approach no it's a good a good example actually and i know um i think they started launching this just at the beginning of lockdown i think and they were in the uk they were inviting to the ambassador's residence and things they were really working around other countries looking for genuinely uh, international uh, entries and um quite yeah really dynamic offering any other ideas regions territories markets where else might we look for good ideas or at least good questions i, I can't, can't quite remember who it is that said that um you know the future is here it's just unevenly distributed um <laughs> but i i seek inspiration from the 94 mega cities around the world that members of the C40 network that all yeah. signed up to very ambitious goals on climate change at mayoral level and actually getting on and delivering delivering plans so there's there's fantastic opportunities in every part of the world and um and i and i i was sort of take the best policies from here and the best technologies from there and, and you can see it all kind of assembling into a, a really neat recipe which the uk cities can follow great and rebecca one final word maybe even another yeah. business it doesn't have to be a market just oh yeah i was just writing an answer to one of the questions in the in in the panel um yeah i mean we always model our, ourselves and look at um tech disruptors so the kind of famous ones um the, the amazons the the ubers the teslas whether or not you might individually agree or disagree with some things that you've done in terms of they how they've you know not looked at market norms yep. and just done things their own way and i think on the energy side i think a lot of the countries in northern europe are quite advanced in the way that some of the technology we've talked about is already being used as a standard and i also think we can look to the recent catastrophes in texas um with the the weather there in terms of why it's so important that we move to a more flexible grid moving forward because a lot of the challenges there were, were a, a fossil fuel reliant system that basically stuff just just froze up um excellent good good point and um yeah very recent and um 
yeah, very, very difficult, obviously, for the, uh, the people out there when that was happening. So thank you very much. Uh, big thank you to panelists, Rebecca, Richard and Duncan. Also to yourselves, audience, virtually out there in Zoom land for your questions, your comments, some really good stuff. Reminder to check out Elemental, elementalexpo.com, the online community for professionals focused on innovation in heat, water, air and energy, the vital elements in the built environment. As I said at the top of the show, you'll find a full diary of events on the website, upcoming webinars. There's one on digitalization this afternoon and a back catalogue, watch on demand, all free. So thank you again. That's it for today. I've been Jim McClelland, editor at Sust Meme. Thanks for watching. Thank you, panel. See you all again soon. Thank you very much. Thanks all. Thanks, Jim. Thank you.